Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater, home of the public programs for the UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is Paul Malcolm. I'm a programmer at the Archive. Before we begin, as a land-grant institution, the Film and Television Archive at UCLA <clears throat> would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. We are humbled to do work in this community. All of the archive screenings in the Billy Wilder Theater are free admission, thanks to a gift from an anonymous donor, and we are grateful for that support. Finally, as you may know, uh, LA County guidelines have allowed some establishments to lift their indoor mask requirements for guests. UCLA, however, still requires mask wearing indoors at its facilities, regardless of vaccination status. Outside of guests on stage speaking, uh, everyone is required to keep uh, their masks on during tonight's program, and we really thank you for uh, honoring this request. We'll get there one of these days soon. <laughs> Uh, we are always looking for ways to improve our operations at the theater and our offerings on screen, and uh, hearing from you is an important part of that. If you RSVP for this event via Eventbrite, we will be sending you out a follow-up email uh, survey, um, so keep an eye out for that, and we'd love to hear back from you, so um, take a moment and send it back. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, housekeeping done. Thank you all so much for coming out to the first screening in our weekend-long celebration of the extraordinary 50-year career of James Benning. Contested Landscapes, Three Digital Features by James Benning was curated by James Benning and Steve Anker, both of whom are here with us tonight. So if we can get a round of applause for both of them right now. I want to thank uh, James and Steve uh, for organizing this program uh, together for us and for their patience during the two years that we were waiting to put this on. This was originally supposed to happen in the spring of 2020. And now we're finally here. So thank you to both of you. Uh, I also want to thank the Hammer Museum and our amazing colleagues there for co-presenting this program with us the entire weekend. So thank you, Hammer Museum. We will be presenting three of Benning's digital works over the course of the weekend. Tonight we are presenting Ruhr from 2009 and tomorrow night Stemple Pass from 2012. Then on Sunday we are thrilled and honored to present the U.S. premiere of Benning's latest work, United States of America. We are especially honored to have James Benning joining us in person tonight and throughout the weekend. So thank you again, James, for being here with us. Steve Anker has been a visual, a, a vital presence in American film culture throughout his distinguished career as a writer, programmer, and teacher, including 11 years as the Dean of the School of Film and Video at CalArts and co-curator of film and video events at Red Cut in downtown. He's curated series or programs for the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley, London International Film Festival, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Ann Arbor Film Festival and other international festivals and museums. It's been a privilege to work with Steve on this and so many other programs over the years. So to say a little bit more about the weekend and tonight's programs, please help me welcome to the stage, Steve Anker. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to be back here. I've had the pleasure of standing in front of uh, audiences at this wonderful theater a number of times, and uh, it's always a special occasion. So um, I'd like to thank Paul again, um, and K.J. Ralph Miller, the UCLA Film and Television Archive, and the Hammer Museum for co-producing the week's uh, three events, um, as well as the community partners O-Town House, uh, the Los Angeles Gallery, that is presenting two new installations by James this month, which uh, you'll hear more about later. Uh, they're opening, well, one's opening next week and one is already up and they're both special events. Um, and then of course also the Los Angeles Film Forum. Everybody was involved in helping uh, this come to pass. So James Benning, um, James is an internationally renowned independent filmmaker who has been based in the Los Angeles area and teaching at the California Institute of the Arts uh, since 1987. In over 50 years of continual practice, James has self-produced several dozens of films, digital works, and mixed media installations that have been shown throughout the world, including festivals at Cannes, Hong Kong, Berlin, Vienna, Rotterdam, and Sundance, to such museums as the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, the Hammer Museum, the Center Georges Pompidou, the Tate Modern, the Walker Art Center. Among his many awards are two from the National Endowment of the Arts, two Rockefeller Foundation Fellowships, and a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. And in 2007, James was the subject 
of a full career retrospective at the Austrian Film Museum in Vienna. And I've known James and have shown his work beginning in 1979 in Boston, uh, where I was programmed at that point, and where he presented 11 by 14, then a new film. Then I presented several of his new films over the years in San Francisco. In recent years, uh, Berenice Reno and I co-curated four evenings of films and videos over the years that we programmed together at Red Cat. So I'm proud to have been able to see his work develop over these dec decades and his influence as an artist and as a teacher grow. Upon the release of James's new major work that Paul just mentioned, the United States of America, which again will be here on Sunday night at seven o'clock, um, the archive and the Hammer Museum have given us a chance to offer viewers a brief overview of James's later work as a chance to appreciate James's unique aesthetic and cultural achievement. From the 1970s through the early 2000s, James became known as a consummate 16 millimeter American landscape filmmaker who created a body of 34 films from the early one-way boogie woogie and landscape suicide through 10 skies, 13 lakes and RR, his final 16 millimeter film that used the materiality and the elegance of 16 millimeter celluloid image and sound with a richness that few others have equaled. A large body of writing has analyzed and recognized the importance of these films, culminating with a large collection of critical essays published by the Austrian Film Museum titled James Benning and the recent book length essay, 10 Skies by Erica Balsam. And both of these are, are still currently available and they're really rich uh, volumes. I encourage you to, to get them if you haven't already. Since 2009, James has been working with digital technology, extending his concerns in new ways that were made possible through the new medium. The duration of individual shots could be greatly extended with digital to create richer discoveries of time and space and to more fully reveal details and contrasts within each shot that could easily be hidden from view. The uncanny precision of the digital image could reveal new levels of nuance and subtlety, sharpening the viewer's perception, their senses and their power of observation farther than ever before. Much of this later work has been little seen after it first shows and written about other than the moment of its release. So now we're able, we will be able over these three nights to see three of them once again on a large screen and continuous uninterrupted time, as opposed to in a gallery or, you know, in many cases when we're watching them at home when we're able to. And that's what it'll take to allow these digital films to have their full effect. For James Benning, landscape is a function of both immediate and historical time. His films establish situations where individuals have to confront time. Or as he said in a recent interview, quote, time is always the present moment while duration is something else. Time in film is always an illusion. It can speed up, slow down, have ellipses. Generally speaking, the more things that are happening, the faster things seem to go. In addition to challenging perception and inevitably every viewer's patience, James's entire oeuvre investigates issues of documentary and truth, narrative, anti-narrative, personal history, race, collective memory, place, industry, and landscape. So the title of this weekend's three evenings is Contested Landscapes but it's a title that can also stand for James's entire body of work. In addition to creating mesmerizing fields for sensory discovery, James visits and recreates landscapes that are contested in their histories, their uses, their understandings, and they test our own assumptions. They are contested in who controls their uses, who defines their value, and who interprets their heritage. In a sense, every landscape is in conflict and remains contested. Tonight's film, Roar, made in 2009, was James's first digital work and remains his only film that was made outside of the United States. 
takes place in Germany's Ruhr Valley, one of that country's main cradles of industrial manufacture and activity. In ways, it's an analog to the American industrial town, the working class town of Milwaukee, and the area of the Midwest where James grew up. We see continual evidence of the forces of industry, and there's an invisibility of human labor in most of the shots. There's a precision and a repetitiveness to the mechanical automatism, automatism evident throughout that is in more contrast to the human activities we also occasionally see, and that's in contrast with the continual presence of the natural world. I'd like to make one note uh, more, one more note before we begin. Uh, I'd like to actually, before we begin, to introduce James for a few words before, but I'd like to make, make one last point, which is that the on and off screen soundscapes tonight and of the other films this weekend that are uh, captured and created are every bit as subtle, revealing, and immersive as the wondrous world of the film's images. So they are an important, a critical aspect of James's mastery of the moving image. And uh, I just call your attention to maybe occasionally just stepping back and just listening, as well as uh, what you're looking at. And so I'd like to introduce James Benning, who will just come up and say a few words. I agreed to come up here so I could take my mask off. Uh, uh, I won't say much except thanks, Steve, for the comments and the other introductions. Um, yeah, uh, let's talk about Ruhr when it's finished. Um, yeah, okay, I'll see you in a few minutes. Actually, two hours. Every time I see that last shot, it um, becomes more uh, overwhelming to me. And uh, actually, that's a case where it becomes shorter. I don't know if anybody has seen that before, but uh, one would think that one has seen it, but that's never the case with your work. Uh, I just like to ask um, a couple of things, and then we're going to turn open it up to your questions. Um, I know you spend a lot of time. Uh, spending time in each each landscape, each part, each area that you're working in. And you just a little while ago mentioned uh, at dinner that when you made the uh, casting a glance, the film uh, of the uh, spiral jetty, the Smithson spiral jetty, you were out there 16 times. Um, you spent a lot of time in the Ruhr Valley, uh, I'm sure, uh, over, over, over months, I think, wasn't it? And I'm just curious, uh, uh, you must have <laughs> come to these selections uh, gradually. And um, I, would, I would assume, such as in the case with the last uh, image, you must have seen that a lot and had a good sense of it. Uh, <clears throat> I was in, uh, invited to Duisburg uh, for two years in a row uh, for the Duisburg Film Week. Uh, it's a documentary festival, and it's for German films. So I didn't have anything to show, but they invited me to just be there and to do a master class. Um, so for two years, I uh, did a master class with German students that applied to be in the class. And we did a, a rendition of my uh, looking and listening class. Um, so I, w I spent a lot of time uh, with the class going to different areas ar around uh, Duisburg. And since I didn't know Duisburg when I uh, first got there, uh, I had somebody introduce me to somebody that was in the steel industry and that had access to many places. And uh, he led me around uh, that whole area. Uh, so that when I led, led the class, I had some uh, experience with uh, the different uh, industrial landscapes. Uh, 
And then after being there for two years, um, at the second uh, time I was at the festival, um, somebody approached me from German television and asked me if I'd want to make a, a, a film there. And um, I was very enthusiastic about that because the uh, Duisburg reminded me very much of uh, my hometown, Milwaukee, uh, working class, heavy industry, um, and um, full of prejudice. Uh, uh, Milwaukee, when I grew up, uh, was a, a uh, interesting place because it had a socialist mayor for 70 years, and it had uh, more strikes in the 30s uh, than any other city in the US, and yet the unions had exclusionary clauses to keep black people out of the union. And when I was in Duisburg, I saw that there was the same kind of separation uh, in the working class uh, between uh, white workers and, and Muslim workers. So um, Duisburg interested me a great deal because I felt like it was kind of a duplicate of what I grew up in. Uh, and so when uh, they asked me to make a film, I said, yes, I'd like to do it, and this is where I'd like to shoot. And I pretty much named these particular uh, places because I, these were the places I had taken a looking and listening class to. So I thought I would just uh, kind of duplicate uh, what I was looking at in that class. Uh, um, and I haven't seen this film in eight or nine years now. Uh, and I forgot how much I liked the last shot. I think I actually think it's one of the best shots in cinema. If I if I want to bra if I want to brag, I, I I mean I just I'm, I can't believe I made it. So by the time you filmed it, you had a sense of of. Uh, the timing uh, and and the sense of 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 how it would look over over that time you shot it. You sh you chose a sunset, I suppose. Yeah, and, that and uh, what 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 we're looking at is a cooling tower for uh, making coke. And I had one review where somebody uh, said that I filmed the Coca Cola plant, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Uh, um, well, at least coke. I can see a cocaine plant. Uh, yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, but coke is superheated coal, yeah. and this is a state-of-the-art coke plant in the world. People come all over, from all over the world to study this particular plant in Duisburg. It has 48 furnaces, and the furnaces are about 40 yards long and uh, 50 or 60 feet high and about eight feet across. And they fill those with regular coal. And then the, they're superheated uh, and with a, a heating system that heats these layers of coal equally uh, so there's not any hot spots. And after, uh, I think it's 26 hours of cooking, they do a push, which means they open the front door and there's a thing on this side and it just pushes all of this superheated coal into a train car. So whenever they move the train cars, you hear a siren. So what you are hearing is the train car going to the, to the, um, the oven and then uh, the coal is pushed into that train car. And then the train car is moved about 100 yards to go underneath the cooling tower. And once it's under there, as you hear the again the siren when it moves towards that, then they dump 30,000 gallons of, of water onto that superheated coal. And the noise that you hear that you think is the smoke noise is actually the coal exploding and going about two thirds way up that tower and then falling back into the train car. Uh, and then the steam is what's being released. And there's a series of filters in that uh, tower that supposedly traps most of the, the fumes that are dangerous. Uh, 
Um, but there's still quite a few that, that escape into the landscape there. So it isn't really a healthy place to live. But this is, this is uh, the most efficient tower that's been developed and the one that pollutes the least. Uh, um, so I was interested in, in filming it because of that, but it also is so spectacular from the amount of steam that comes off this 30,000 uh, gallons of water that, that's uh, used to cool the coal. Yeah. And then that, that's made into coke, and uh, the coke is superheated coal, and it, it burns very hot, and that's what's used in a blast furnace to make steel or to make iron ore, uh, or to make pig iron out of iron ore. Uh, and then the, the sculpture in the film that's uh, being cleaned, the graffiti's being cleaned off, is a Richard Serra monolith that goes many feet above what you see in my film. And it's built on top of a slag uh, pile that's about, uh, well, it's quite a big mountain, actually of slag, which the slag comes from um, uh, the coal mining and the nearby industry that's used to make this coke. Uh, and so Sarah was able to capture, to use that whole slag mountain and to level it off and keep the whole flat top clean because it uh, it would grow, it, it's uh, has a lot of minerals in it, and it actually grows a lot of weeds and and a lot of flowers in the spring. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is a lot of the flowers that grow on top of that slag uh, come from Africa, uh, from seeds, uh, from the uh, iron ore that's brought from Africa to be made into steel. Uh, the seeds come along on, on however they move it there by, I believe, a railroad. Uh, and so uh, we have these uh, flowers that are um, transported along with the, uh, with the uh, iron ore. Uh, I find the, the uh, graffiti on that, uh, st that structure very poignant, actually. Do you know what it, I don't know what it says. I used well, to Well, I just know see the it. hearts and yeah. uh, you see yeah. the face in the bottom. Yeah. And it's just the idea that it attracted, uh, you know, the, the, whoever, the kids or the average people sort of interacting with this uh, amazing uh, phenomenon, which is also this high art piece, actually. And, uh, and then this laborer just taking this extraordinary amount of time to clean it off, you know, fraction yeah. by fraction. Well, it, it questions what is art and who claims what art is, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, what gets removed and what gets to stay. The funny thing is it took about two weeks to clean all that graffiti off, and I went back there six months later, and it was full of graffiti again. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of a never-ending job, yeah. I guess. So, so I, I find each composition... Um, very extraordinary. I mean, I, the uh, the second one of the steel mill, of the steel. Uh, I assume that you had enough time, plenty of time to determine the exact framing of that. But yeah, it's an well, amazing had, f uh, series of motions. Uh, the The film was um, paid for by ZDF, which is one of the biggest television stations uh, in, or it is the biggest television station in Germany. So I, um, because of that, you get a, 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 a letter and it almost gets you into anything. And then a friend of mine, uh, uh, they first assigned me a, a uh, producer that I didn't get along with at all. So I, I hired a, a a friend of mine to be the producer that's fluent in English and German, and she was really good at getting us into any place we wanted to go, plus this letter from ZDF. So I was able to spend a couple of weeks in two different steel mills uh, in Duisburg, which was quite fantastic. And what you see there is the end process of uh, the steel being made they first take iron ore and heat that into pig iron, and then they, they, the pig iron gets 
different additives into the steel to make it either uh, sh sharper so you can, uh, you know, uh, or stronger or uh, uh, more malleable. And so there's, they, they add these different uh, additives to that. And what you saw here was at the end, they kind of squirted out like tooth toothpaste into these long tubes of molten uh, steel. And then that steel, you saw it uh, red hot in the background. That would go this way out of frame, and then it turned around. And what you saw in the foreground was that same steel only three hours later after it slowly rolled over these kind of wave-like surfaces. Um, so that you see the hot steel and then you see what it looks like about three hours later where it's still very hot, but it isn't glowing anymore. And that was near the end of it. And once it gets there, then they're able to start to stack it up. Uh, yeah. uh, and the mosque, that's... Uh, an amazing shot, uh, not only being in that location, but... Yeah, that was one of those lucky things where uh, I set up the camera not knowing it was going to be uh, so crowded. And I did, a, I think, an hour and a half shot. Uh, so it starts with an empty, uh, empty room and then slowly people come in. And then it got more crowded and more crowded. So I used just the end of the shot, basically. And I was really surprised that I like that some people want to leave very quickly and then others stay after. And, and the individual praying is so different than the group praying. So I, I kind of uh, um, liked what happens in that shot that we, we see them. Uh, near the end of praying on their own rather than the group. And, and the, um, you didn't encounter resentment with the camera? Uh, well, it's interesting because that mosque was, uh, was supposed to be built in Cologne, and people of Cologne didn't want it there. And so I don't know if they couldn't get a permit or they decided, well, we don't want to go where we're not wanted. And then the, the city of Duisburg, uh, which is poor and and needs you know more income. They opened their arms to having a mosque built there, and it was interesting also because they built the mosque with very large windows, so when you drive by, you can look in and see that it's a serious religious ceremony that's got it going on. It isn't people plotting to you know take over the world or whatever. Uh, fantasies we have about Muslims, um, and yeah, they they were they were very kind. They were very happy to have me film there because they wanted to show the process and that they're serious about the religion. And uh, 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 yeah, they um, I came in with my tripod and uh, they yelled at me because I didn't clean off the bottom. You know, and they gave me things to, like socks for it to wear. And, uh, so I like that. Uh, let's uh, let's open it up. And uh, can you raise your hand if you're interested in commenting or questioning, uh, having a question about it tonight's film? Yes. Take a minute. <laughs> The, the first shot is a tunnel that's, uh, that connects two different parts of the steel mill. Um, and uh, it's one of the first places I took my class to because you walk into the tunnel, it's like living in black and white, and then the, a colorful car comes through. And then you hear sounds from, from the steel mill within the tunnel that kind of echo through there. There's a, in fact, there's the sound of, of a, uh, I think it's a train whistle that happens at the very beginning of that tunnel. And that same whistle happens at the very end of the last shot. So there, there's kind of a connection. And, and I didn't put those there. Those were actually in the shot that they 
happened to uh, bookend the film with. Um, yeah, it's just a very old tunnel that's been there a while, and uh, uh, it's a way to get from one part of the plant to another. So all that traffic has to do with workers going to the work or, or ch changing pl uh, different places they work. The steel mills also are very uh, highly uh, controlled by uh, I don't know, computers at this time. So there's hardly any people working in the mills like it used to be. It was, I was surprised how few people were actually doing things. It was mainly a, a, a room with a control room with a lots of computers and things that were, were going on, where there was a lot of handwork in the past. And it's right underneath a um, tremendous amount of, of activity. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's not, there used to be tremendous amount of activity. Now it's mainly all somehow done by machines that are yeah. controlled by computers. Can you speak up? Oh, I was just going to say your comment about your last shot being really one of the most extraordinary shots in cinema history. I think you're right. It's really something. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, I was kind of kidding, but... <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, I, I think it's one of your greatest shots. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe that's true. Okay. There's a one over here. Wow, is just that was amazing. Uh, the steel plant and and then the the second part with the uh, coke plant. And thank you for explaining about the science of the coal and things. But yeah. just like devastating, uh, you cannot help but think where we are today in the world with our environmental and the climate crisis. But um, I, I, I really had um, uh, optimism. Uh, I, I know that was filmed like, I think a couple of decades ago, maybe 2000? No, sure. it was just 13 years ago. Okay, only 13 years ago. But when you look at Germany today, how the Green Party has gained um, growth, you know, every election, and that Germany is like the leader with uh, getting away from cold and using renewable energy. So, to me, it's like, wow, the change that is now happening in Germany versus, yeah. when, you know, when you film that. I, I, I was just wondering um, if that uh, cooler center is still in operation. I, I guess it might be, but certainly Germany has probably become more um, yeah, regulatory but... with emissions <clears throat> controls and things like that that maybe aren't happening at that level now that yeah. they were when you filmed it. But it was fascinating. Nobody has uh, invented a way to uh, get um, uh, iron ore to melt into pig iron without using coal, uh, coke. So there, we still need coke plants. So if you're going to drive a car that has steel in it, you're, you're uh, demanding that coke is being made and that uh, things get let into the air. Uh, however, that, like I said, that coke plant is so much more efficient than it was, you know, even 30 years ago. Uh, but it's still admitting things. Uh, but most, most of that is steam that you see. Uh, but there are da dangerous things too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about the sound and to what extent any of it is designed versus captured. And I thought of it, especially in that first shot, because you see that minute piece of plastic kind of going along and, and the sound really draws your attention to it. And it made me think about how much you're, yeah, how much you're doing on set and how much you're doing later. It's, 
it's all shot in sync. And then um, I also, I always take extra sound that's wild. So if there's a, uh, a, no a noise that occurs that is, seems out of place, I might remove that. And occasionally I might add a sound, but I try not to, um, I try not to uh, make it clever, you know. I tr what, whatever it's, manipulations I do to the sound, I do it to make it sound more real than um, more fantasy-like or, 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 or a lie. I'm really interested in uh, sound image relationships and how uh, um, these little quiet sounds are meaningful and, and uh, um, sometimes uh, alert you to off-screen space and things like that. But, yeah, but but it it pretty much sounds um, like it should sound, you know. There's nothing uh, added to fool you or make it more dramatic. Now I know you spoke in terms of having known the locations that you wanted to film, but I wonder if you had a, a structure in mind as to the order that you were going to put them in. Because I noticed that you began, it seems that you began underground and gradually came up. I, I uh, sh shot a lot of footage for this uh, film, which I generally don't do, because I didn't know quite what it was going to be. And the, the very last shot I made, actually, is the hour-long shot that is at the end of the film. And... Um, I had been shooting the that uh, Coke Tower. I shot it. It's right along the um, what's the famous river in uh, in Germany, the long one. Anyway, yeah, the Rhine River. I I shot it from the other side of the Rhine. I shot it from a, another vantage point where I was as high as the tower, and then the very last day I was there. Uh, my producer and I, we uh, had a long uh, lunch uh, along the river, and then we're, I was going to go back and shoot it from the top again, but it was getting dark, so I thought, I'll do this one from below. And uh, so it was kind of an accident that I shot from that angle. Um, but I did want to shoot... I knew I wanted to do a long shot that would go from dusk to almost dark because I had been watching the tower and, and watching the way the the uh, smoke or the uh, water vapor would change color at the end of the day. That really interested me. Well, and at the end of the shot, it becomes, to me at least, quite... Uh... I went off monstrous, but it's very dark, and that is both physically and emotionally. Yeah. Um, along with like choosing the shots, um, I'm wondering like when you decide how long you're gonna shoot a certain scene. Uh -huh. um, and does that also um, influence kind of what could change, what could uh, happen on, like, random things could occur, like, um, say something you weren't expecting, you know, to happen? Obviously, you're there for many hours, but, yeah, how do you decide how long? Yeah, thanks, because I didn't actually answer that one question uh, <laughs> before. Um that uh, once I did the, the hour long shot, um, that made me understand what, what the structure would be because I knew that I wanted to end the film with that hour. So I thought, okay, I'll take some, a number of shots that I had made and make that into an hour. So it would be kind of match the second hour. So I, kind of built it backwards. Uh, and yeah, um, when you shoot over time, you do learn things. Um, at, 
but most of this I learned from uh, taking my class to these places and uh, observing, uh, especially at the Dusseldorf airport. I took my class under the, where they're right at the end of the uh, runway where the planes are landing. And we went there kind of later, a little later in the day. And um, I like the landing lights were lighting up the forest. And that's the shot I actually wanted to do. But when I tried to do that, they weren't as bright as I thought they were. And they didn't register well on my uh, high definition camera. Um, so then I went back the next day and I filmed earlier in the day. Um, and I didn't realize that uh, when jets land, they actually drag behind them a weather system and it really uh and it it lags behind so after they pass by what was it 10 or 15 seconds you feel the coming through and then because i was lucky enough to shoot on a day where there was no wind you you could tell that the it was the jets that were creating this weather system uh pulling this uh uh, behind and the leaves would fall. It was, I shot it in November, so it was at that time of the year that. So those things are kind of an accident. And uh, uh, but if you go and you know if you put yourself in enough places, you uh, generally find some good accidents like that. So I really like that shot. Um, and then the timing of that shot, the airplanes kind of come in um, one after another, but not exactly at the same pace. So some come in faster than others. So I like the way that time uh, worked in that shot, that it isn't, you know, a plane comes, a plane comes, and then one doesn't come for a while and one comes. And with the uh, last shot, um, that process, since they have these 48 ovens, they can do a push every about nine minutes. And when I was filming, after two pushes that we saw two of these, they had trouble pushing that one, and the process was delayed. And so there's a section in the end film where there isn't a push for about... 15 or 16 minutes. So I kind of like that, that this was supposed to be, um, I thought I knew the timing would be nine minutes, nine minutes, nine minutes, nine minutes, but that didn't happen. And then when it didn't happen, it was at the best part of the shot. It was where night was really just starting. So since there was no push, you get for to look at the sky for, nine minutes as it slowly gets darker and there you, there's some really beautiful blue colors and um, so again this is kind of lucky that the, in the process uh, they had a problem and, and uh, it, uh, um, it, it didn't give what was expected and I like those kind of surprises. Uh, just a quick thing, um, have you ever seen uh, Chantal Ackerman's uh, News From Home? Um, I thought a lot about the ending of that movie compared to this, and it. What is the yeah, yeah, I've seen that many times, uh, and the end is it pulling away in the in the pulling away from Staten the city Island in the ferry. fog. Yeah, just gives me the same sense of yeah. utter doom. Yeah, <laughs> personally, but God bless her soul. Hey, James, um, I apologize because I had to step out at the beginning of the Q&A, so I'm sorry if someone has already asked this question or Steve had asked this question because Steve was suggesting, seemed to be suggesting that every time you see one of your films as an audience member, that second viewing you experience the duration of time differently and suddenly there can be things, it always seems to me, second time around, narrative elements start to come in because you're, you, there's an element of suspense as you wait for the bicyclists, bicyclists to come in or you wait for the, because you know the next plane's coming. So we're experiencing duration differently on multiple viewings. 
And so I'm very really curious how you experience that when you're producing the films and it really related to your last answer, when you're thinking about how long the shot's going to last, there's that first time when you see the footage, you're experiencing duration in one way. The second time you see it, you're experiencing it. Maybe it feels like it's moving a little faster or that kind of thing. Do you ever have to, do you have a process or do you feel a need to ever kind of try and reset to go back to that original experience of the image? Or how do you experience duration of these shots as you're making these decisions and you're working with the material? Well, you're kind of putting a finger on something that's very difficult to to um, feel duration when you know the duration already. Um, yeah, um, I haven't seen this film for about eight years, so it was like new for me. But I, I, uh, it went much quicker today because I. Uh, I didn't have the anxiety that I generally have with, I feel bad for audiences um, that I make them work so hard. Um, but I didn't feel that today. But it, yeah, it's hard to uh, judge. Um, but I always err on the long side, so that, that's the good part. You know, I wouldn't cut it short because I'm afraid I'm going to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't make entertainment. I mean, I hope it's 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 uh, f somewhat fun to watch my films, but they're also difficult. Um, well, I think people. Pro well, for tomorrow's myself, is even harder. I think. Well, it's got more narrative. Um, but I think it uh, it makes <laughs> I think that that um, it's a, it's a process of back and forth. Certainly, I mean I can't imagine anybody is zoned in one hundred percent for the duration of two hours. On the other hand, coming and going in different ways, you know, depending on what they're responding to, you know, is also such an important experience. You never have that in the cinema. I was I was really um, I didn't drift off once this time, which is pretty good. Yeah. But I, that's part of it. I think you bring your own life into it. If you start thinking about having to do your laundry, you know, and, and you realize there, it, somehow that's part of the film. Uh, yeah. Do we have any other questions in the all the way in the back? We we um, I try I try to get people to understand that it's hard work and w when they go they should at least take some time to uh, be on their own. I try to keep them separate, but I also I also want us to have some fun too. Um, but I I try to get them to really work hard and sit down and really pay attention because you have to practice doing that. And then uh, we always, I always try to have dinner at the end of the day. So then uh, we don't always talk about what we did, but I, there's something about eating together that's, I think, important to uh, bring the experience together with everybody. So that's kind of how I think about it. And what I've noticed in the past is that uh, a lot of students that have been in the class, their work gets more subtle after uh, they've taken the class. I know that I attended one day's uh, class several years ago, and James took the group to a forest which uh, had a kind of a precipice, a jutting out huge stone that had a, a big drop at the end of it. And it was kind of at an angle, actually. And I was the dean at the time. I was very scared. <laughs> that said, I didn't say anything to anybody else. But the thing is, it was rather remarkable. 
uh, for everybody to be dealing with balance, to be de yeah. further back. And then we were there for maybe an hour. And after that, uh, you took us to a river. I don't remember which it was, but it was quite a dramatic river with lots of uh, jagged boulders on the side. Uh, we were climbing around the boulders for another <clears throat> hour or so. Um, and then during that same semester, I know that you took students through a mountain. <laughs> yeah, we did that last week again, which was. But I think uh, I think James day. takes people. If I'm correct about this, James takes people into areas that are drivable. Although sometimes it may take a whole day to drive, that um, he has discovered. You know, because uh, he's uh, James is a wanderer, and he really. <laughs> Sunday's film includes a lot of wandering. Kind of. Uh, any other any other question? Yes. Um, how do I know when I'm done shooting a particular shot, or, or if I should keep looking for other shots? I, I, I generally try to do one thing in a day, and if I, I don't, if I finish that, I quit, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I, because, and I don't shoot something right away until I really know it, uh, I don't go somewhere and then just shoot. I'll go there first and experience it and then shoot it some other time. Well, I have one more question myself. Um, much in a, in a very different way than with film, digital obviously can be manipulated and it conveys a, ver a veracity uh, to it like the, like the opening shot, the tunnel shot. Um, is that something that you're tempted to interfere with ever in terms of the truthfulness of of the look of what we seem to be seeing in actual time um yeah i've i've since i've done uh, digital i've done a lot of manipulation most of the time it's to make it more uh real mm -hmm. uh, than surreal um and then where I did that the most was on my film, Small Roads, where I would shoot a sky somewhere and put it somewhere else. Or I'd even change the texture of a road from one road to another. Uh, yeah, that was more like, oh, I like what you can do. I got to try. What can I do with this to make it look more real? But it, yeah, the digital is interesting. Uh, this film was my first one, so I didn't know you could do all that stuff. So it's pretty much what I shot. Okay, oh, we have one more. Okay, maybe the last. He's asking about when I, I was a child about uh, paying attention. And uh, I, I had an uncle that, uh, uh, who adopted uh, a son and uh, he, he was my uh, mother's brother. And so he would take me and my brother and his adopted son um, just on walks and things, and uh, he didn't teach me to look and listen, but it, it he provided experiences that made you want to look and listen. Um, so I did that quite at a quite early age. Yeah, I I was. What, what I, kinds of things would you look and listen? Look at and listen to. Uh, uh, for instance. Uh, I was thinking the other day it was it was uh, it was uh, kind of warm, but or there was a cool wind and there was sun, and you can uh, feel heat and cold at the same time. 
And I remember experiencing that at about eight or nine years old and thinking how important that was. And I didn't really know what I was meant by important until later, you know, that I think back. But I thought, oh, I was pretty smart at eight years old to, to know that it's important to be able to feel hot and cold at the same time. And that that's a pretty uh, uh, important thing to learn, I think, you know, that two things can happen like that. So, so yeah, that I've kind of paid attention to things like that early. Uh, and I, I don't know, I've, I, what really maybe um, made me understand looking and listening is uh, when I was, I dropped out of graduate school in mathematics uh, and I went out west. Uh, I dropped out because people in my neighborhood, friends of mine were dying in Vietnam and I had a, a student deferment and that made me uncomfortable. Um, so I went out west and I met people that were, um, in Denver I met some people that were running a dropout school. Or, um, uh, I'm sorry, that was a different thing. They, they were running a, a, a halfway house for, uh, people that were getting arrested for being drunk, and they would go to the uh, to the courtrooms and and try to beg the judges to allow these guys to come to their halfway house rather than go to prison. And so I worked with them for a while, and then I worked with migrant workers, uh, picking potatoes and that. And those kind of experiences, uh, I think, were really important for me to really see and learn about uh, things uh, of uh, kind of how you feel in different situations. And, and so you help. I was, you know, like I felt good about helping people, but I also realized I was learning so much more than what I was giving. That was very important to me. I think that's what made me uh, want to really pay attention to those situations. Well, all right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up then. And uh, thank James for both the film and for this right. commentary. Thank you. Yeah.